Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here. Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be a Bible study on the book of Zechariah. Now, there's Zephaniah, and then there's Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. -E they are both among the minor prophets. Zechariah is the second to the last book in the King James Bible for the Old Testament. So, a little bit of background here. When Israel, northern Israel, was taken into captivity by the Assyrians, uh, the Assyrians also took part of Judah. They tried to take Jerusalem, but they couldn't. God gave Jerusalem and Judah a chance to repent. And, well, over time, they didn't. Well, then along comes the Babylonians. And they took Jerusalem captive. You can read about that in the book of Jeremiah. You can read about that in the book of Daniel, about the activities of them in Babylon. Now, after 70 years, God punished them for 70 years. Uh, you think about it, that's basically a lifetime of anybody. So all the people that God was unhappy with in Jerusalem were pretty much all gone dead and gone at the end of 70 years. God has a new crop, so to speak. And in the book of Daniel, the Medes and the Persians, which is the descendants of modern-day Iran, um, came against Babylon and took them and destroyed the city. Uh, Daniel was a very old man by the time this happened. King Cyrus of Persia, who was later succeeded by Darius, or Darius, depending upon, you know, how you pronounce it, the and the, Caribbean, Caribbean, uh, tomato, tomato, uh, you know. But uh, they were allowed to return. Judah was allowed to return to Jerusalem. And you can read about this at the end of the 70 years. Ezra was the high priest. And the book of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was the king. So after 70 years, they go back to Jerusalem. And that's what they record. Now, there were two prophets that were part of this returning to Jerusalem. One was Haggai, and the other was Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is a very interesting book. Uh, part of it was the present when he was alive. Part of it covers where, the, where it talks about Christ, or the Messiah. And then other parts are the very, very end times. And that's what I'm going to try to do a commentary on. So let's take a look. All right, so enough with the introduction. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berchiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Oh yeah, he was not happy with them. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts. And I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. 
be ye not as your fathers. Oh yeah, don't be like don't be like those before. Uh-uh. No, be different. Be ye not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Oh, yeah. God warned them. Would they listen? No. No, we're going to do what we want to do. We're not going to listen to that. Verse 5. So the Lord asks, Your fathers, where are they? Well, they're in the ground, buried. They're dead. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? And the answer is, nope. Verse 6, But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sebat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berchiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, All right, we're going to take a look at a couple things. We're going to look up red, and we're going to look up horse. Verse 8, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses, speckled and white. Now, keep that in mind, because we're going we're gonna to come back to this. I'm going to take a look at some things here. Now, what I like about the King James Bible is word associations. Usually, like when there's a, like a number or a color or a phrase or the first time a word appears in scriptures, uh, you take a look around in a Bible type search engine and it will give you the meaning of that word or phrase. Now, I like using the King James Bible online, but sometimes it falls really short. I mean, I'll look for a word sometimes that I know for a fact is in the King James Bible, and it'll tell me, not found. And I'm like, what? And then other times it'll find it. So it's not consistent. But there's also another thing called the Blue Letter Bible. And I don't like using it. It was connected with Chuck Missler, who was involved in military intelligence. He was one of the founders of Calvary Chapel. Uh, not exactly my favorite group. I was invited to go to church one time about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago. Went to Calvary Chapel, sat down. And after the opening rock and roll show happened, uh, the guy uh, that calls himself a pastor uh, did a sermon. It was mostly jokes and stories and whatnot. I think he mentioned the Bible like twice. But uh, it was... <laughs> uh, all I know is Satan could have sat in through that sermon and he would not have been offended. No way. But uh, Blue Letter Bible, I think they put that out uh, to see what people go and use it so that when the time comes to collect us, they know who is who. I don't think they made the Blue Letter Bible uh, search engine for people to learn more about the Bible. I just don't believe that, but that's my opinion. God will judge whether or not Chuck Missler was 
a true man of the Lord, as most people think, or if he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. But, uh, you know, Calvary Chapel, what can I tell you? But I'm going to have to use the Blue Letter Bible because the King James Bible online uh, would not let me. One time it gave me the, the word red, but the second time it wouldn't do it. So, all right, let's take a look at red. Why red? What does that have to do with horses? So, and oh, by the way, people, um, you know, right now we have the internet, and the internet's wonderful. I mean, I can do, uh, using the Blue Letter Bible, I was able to do a three-month Bible uh, class for my Bible college. I think it was in the master's, at the master's level. I was able to do a, a master's level Bible college class in a four-day, I think it was four days, maybe four and a half days. I was able to do a three-credit class in four days, maybe four and a half, because I was able to look up everything. You know, if you look up a phrase, you look up the word Jesus. Every time the word Jesus appears in the Bible, boom, there it is. So if you're looking for something, um, how many times did Jesus cure lepers? Look up the word leper or leprosy. Boom, every time it's, it's right there. So I was able to uh, cut and paste Bible scriptures and uh, put them on paper and then, you know, send it in. So it was an, a, a phenomenal tool because when I first started doing uh, the Bible college, I had to use a typewriter. And boy, that took, that was a lot of work. But, you know, the Blue Letter Bible and the King James Bible online, wonderful, wonderful tools. But how long are we going to have the internet? I, I don't know. And I once had a discussion with a pastor who I respect greatly, uh, a great deal. Guy knows probably, uh, he's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. But, uh, you know, he's like, well, you know, the internet's the tool of the devil. Well, yeah. Uh, the two most popular things on the internet are porn and gambling. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, usually for these Bible studies, I use the King James Bible online, looking things up makes it easy. But I said, you know what? Paper, uh, you know, the internet can be used for porn and gambling. That's true. But look at paper. Paper, you could either print a Bible or Playboy. So should we throw away the Bible because paper's used to print Playboy or Playgirl for, you know. Uh, well, so Bibles or Playboy, and I am, in my life I've read both, or looked at both, I should say, but uh, not proud of it, not bragging, just, just saying. So, all right, uh, let's take a look at, and I'm trying to give you some ideas for study tools here, you know. So let's take a look at red. All right, so let's take a look at some things. Uh, I'm not going to make a big study on red or horses, you know, if you could always take a look, uh, you know, if you're more interested in going more detail. Uh, numbers and colors are have interesting meanings in the Bible. So, all right, in Genesis 25, 25, there was this guy named Esau, and he didn't like God, and God didn't like him. Read Malachi chapter 1. So, when he was born, it says, and the first came out red. Now, does that mean his hair was red or his skin was red? You know, not an Ind American Native Indian, no. But, uh, you know, uh, whites have red skin because they're, the blood shows through the skin. You know, ladies, when you go to the cosmetic counter and you buy blush and you put blush on your cheeks you know you want to have red cheeks well that's what 
reference is. So, so and the first, the kid, the child, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Now, uh, and then Esau, in uh, Genesis 25 and verse 30, came from the field, and I guess he didn't catch anything, and he was hunting, and, you know, he was hungry. So he got, he wanted to eat some of the red pottage, which is uh, red lentils. And uh, therefore his name was called Edom. He was the father of the Edomites. So, but more on that later. Now, when Israel went through the wilderness, after they left Egypt, what did they go through? The Red Sea. Remember? Now, when you look at red clay, or, you know, maybe the sea is red, uh, the Red Sea, usually the color of red has to do with iron. Have you ever seen rust on, you know, steel rusting? It turns red. Well, that's what it is. Iron, it, when it oxidizes, when it's exposed to oxygen, it turns red, has rust. Now, I don't know if that's true with the Red Sea, but I do know that when you go and you see red clay, that's why. Because it's full of iron, iron oxide. So, uh, just a side note. There are people who say, well, you know, Israel really didn't go through the Red Sea uh, you know, what they did was is they went through the Sea of Reeds. Now, the Sea of Reeds is, uh, they say it's basically no deeper than your uh, knees. They says, well, that's how they could cross, you know, they could cross the Sea of Reeds is because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't deep. But, uh, and they'll say, well, that was a miracle. God, God took them through the Sea of Reeds. That was only ankle deep, you know, or maybe knee deep. I don't know. But really, the real miracle is that Pharaoh's army drowned in ankle deep water. Yeah. You know what? Don't listen to these modern Bible scholars. They're devils. No, they went through the Red Sea. It parted. It says the dry land. They crossed on the dry land. Yeah. All right, so the Red Sea. Crossing the Red Sea was salvation for Israel, but it was the doom of the Egyptian army. Now, in Exodus 25.5, um, they took ram skins and they dyed them red. And that was for the tabernacle. All right. I'm supposing that has to do with blood. I don't know. Now, in Numbers 19.2, we read, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord hath commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer, you know, type of cow, without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. Uh, they would take the red heifer, they would burn it, and use the ashes as a ceremonial cleansing of the tabernacle, and their, I believe they did that for the temple, too. Matter of fact, the uh, you-know-who's out in the Middle East, uh, they found a red heifer, I believe in Pennsylvania. Somebody had a herd or a couple couple of uh, a red heifer or a herd or something and they bought them to take them over to the Israeli state so that they could uh, ceremonially cleanse the temple so now here's an interesting verse Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 uh, this is a well let's read it come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, 
they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Well, see, this is, there was prophesied salvation in the Old Testament. You know, white as snow, red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And they're not talking about uh, Baba black sheep. No. White as snow. Somebody give the uh, black Hebrews a, a, a memo here, right? All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to take a look at some horses and some colors, red specifically. Revelation 6 and verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now, when you talk about sword, you're, they're talking about war here. Verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, and lo, a black horse. Black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, in Roman times, a penny was the daily wage for an unskilled laborer. So if you were an unskilled laborer and you worked all day long, you would get a penny. Don't think about a penny as what it's worth today. When I was a kid, you could get three Tootsie Rolls for a penny. Yeah. What does a penny buy now? Nothing. Um, you can't even pay the tax for a penny. So it would take you for a measure of wheat a day's wage. And a measure of wheat, wheat is not that much. I mean, that's like a loaf of bread, people. So evidently, there is some kind of a famine going on. Can you imagine working all day for a loaf of bread? Uh, let's see. Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed, on, uh, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger, famine, and with death and with the beasts of the earth. A fourth part of the earth. Uh, let's see. There are, I believe, I'm not sure. Let me look up how many billions of people live on the earth and we'll figure out what a fourth part of that is. Well, people, that's about 1.9 billion people. If you don't know what a billion is, well, like Ken Hoven used to say, don't worry about it. When Congress is spending money, they don't know what a billion is either. But uh, a billion is 1,000 millions. 1,000 millions is a billion. Yeah, that's a lot of people, pe dead people. All right, so let's get going. All right, Revelation 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, God's altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God 
and for the testimony which they held. Now, here's souls of people that were slain for the word of God and for their testimony. They acknowledged Jesus Christ. Now, there's people who tell you, oh, no, no, that's, you know, when you die, that's it. Your soul sleep, you know. It's like you went to sleep and, you know, until you're resurrected, you, you don't exist. Well, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they, who? Those that were slain. And they cried with a loud voice. Oh, they must have been sleepwalking, huh? And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Oh, yeah. All right, so what about, uh, you know, so there's uh, horses have to do with judgment, right? The different colored horses. But the red, the color red, uh, is there another place where the color red exists? Oh, yeah. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. Boy, I've beaten Revelation chapter 12 to death, but we're going to read this uh, verse again. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red, red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Ooh. All right, so who is this great red dragon? Well, Revelation 12, skip down to verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Cast out of where? Heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. And yeah, there's people who tell you that dev the devil and Satan are two different beings. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Bingo! So, horses in a prophetic uh, frame of mind can mean judgment. But uh, the white horse, well, let's take a look at Revelation 19, verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Now I did a study on the four and twenty elders. Uh, personally, I think they are the twelve tribes of Israel. Uh, the, the twelve, the, you know, the original twelve tribes. And the twelve apostles, minus Judas, add Paul. Boy, I tell you what, uh, if if Paul is one of these four and twenty elders, I'm wondering what all these Paul deniers are gonna, what they're gonna be looking at. I don't know. All right, so verse five, and a voice came out of the throne saying. Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. That means all-powerful. 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. That's the church, people. You know, <laughs> these idiots will tell you that the bride of Christ and Israel are two separate, different things. No. There's only going to be one bride. God is not a polygamist. The church and Israel are going to be the same. There's one bride. That's it. God's not a polygamist. Oh, wait, I said that. Yeah. And his wife hath made herself ready. Wife, not wives, plural. No, wife, singular. Eight. And to her, not them, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Hmm, why white? I thought they were black Hebrews. No. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Uh, yeah, that fine linen are covering. The righteousness of the saints, well, that's, that's the righteousness of Christ. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. I had somebody just uh, about a week ago said, Nope, Revelation was a lie. The book of Revelation is a lie. He got blocked real quick. Verse 10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. So this, you know, John fell at the feet of this angel telling him all this stuff, right? Because he thought he was God. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Did you know that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy? Oh, yeah. Now, here's the punchline. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written, that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's go back to Zechariah chapter 1. Oh, let's see. Verse 8. Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 8. All right, I think you know what red and horses has some reference to. I'm not claiming to understand this perfectly. I'm kind of wading through this just like everybody else, you know. I saw by night, behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behold him... I'm sorry, and behind him were their red horses speckled and white. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what are these? And the angel talked with me, said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, 
We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast have had indignation these threescore and ten years? Yeah, seventy years. So, there, you know, he's asking, how long is it going to be till you have mercy on Jerusalem and the other cities of uh, Judah? And the Lord answered, answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. Oh, yeah. The heathen that hate the Lord, they're at ease. They don't, they're not afraid of anything. They're, they're all fat and happy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Whose affliction? The affliction of uh, Judah and Jerusalem, right? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. Now, if you want to read about that, Ezra and Nehemiah. Those are two books in the Bible. They record the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple, the house, the temple of the Lord. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Well, that's what, you know, when you're, when you're building a, 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 a structure, you stretch a line. You know, because you take a line and you pull it tight between two points, and then you know it's straight. You know, you want a wall, you want to build a wall that's straight. You don't want a crooked wall, right? So that's a, uh, that's a carpentry thing. I don't know much about it, but you know, I know what it is. 17. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities, through prosperities, shall ye be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall he yet choose Jerusalem. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. Now, when you talk about horns in the Bible, um, uh, Sometimes it's something that's attached to an animal's head, but sometimes it's symbolic of governments or powers or kings, has reference to that. Verse 19, And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, or nations, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. All right, people, this is the end of the my commentary on Zechariah chapter 1. Uh, there are some mentions of the crucifixion in other chapters of Zechariah. And I believe that there is a description of nuclear war in Zechariah. But I'm going to try to make, make it through... Uh, this entire chapter doing a commentary, God willing, of course. And uh, what can I tell you? All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. 
In Jesus' precious name, amen.